Friends, let me invite you to find a place of comfort and repose, if you haven't already. About to begin. Well, good evening, friends. My name is Kelly Aspruth Jackson, and I am one of the ministers here. Let me welcome you to the First Unitarian Society of Madison, where we question boldly, listen humbly, grow spiritually, act courageously, and love unapologetically. Thank you so much for joining us for this evening's Candidates Forum. I want to give credit and appreciation to the members of our congregation's climate action team and other associated volunteers who have helped to organize this event. Also extend our appreciation to our co-sponsoring organizations, the Sierra Club for Lakes chapter, Faiths Connect for Climate Action, Renew Wisconsin, 350 Wisconsin, Citizens Climate Lobby, and Wisconsin Creation Care Ambassadors. Uh, our deep appreciation to this evening's moderator, Bob Lindemeyer. Uh, oh, word of practicality, the nearest bathrooms are out those doors and to your left. Uh, there are more bathrooms uh, around the corner, either up the ramp up or up the couple of steps and down the hall. Let me introduce you before I get out of the way and let the proceedings proceed to our candidates. And thank you very much to each of them for being with us tonight. Uh, Melissa Agard is the state senator for the 16th Senate District of Wisconsin, where she serves as a member of the Council on Domestic Abuse, the Wisconsin Commission for the United States Semiquincentennial Commission, and the Women's Council. She is also a member of the National Caucus of Environmental Legislators, Great Lakes St. Lawrence Legislative Caucus, and the legislators' organization, Women in Government. Dana Pellabon is the executive director of RCC Sexual Violence Resource Center in Dane County, and also coordinates community partnerships for countywide sexual assault victim services through the Sexual Assault Response Team, the Commission on Sensitive Crimes, and the Domestic Violence and Sexual Violence Coordinated Community Response Team. She serves on the board of directors for Outreach LGBTQ Plus Center, Urban Triage, Freedom Inc., and World Builders. Dana also serves as a Dane County Supervisor for District 33. Wesley Sparkman is the director of the Tamara G. Grigsby Office for Equity and Inclusion in Dane County and serves as chairman of the SSM Health Wisconsin Board of Directors. He also serves as vice chair of the UW-Madison School of Sociology's Board of Visitors and is a current member of the Madison Metropolitan School District Superintendent's Human Resource Advisory Committee and the United Way Law Enforcement Leaders of Color Collaboration. And Regina Vidiver serves as Alder for District 5 on the Madison Common Council. Professionally, she oversees statewide chronic disease and cancer prevention programs for the Wisconsin Department of Health Services Division of Public Health. Prior to her election, she served as a resident member of the Madison Food Policy Council, Healthy Retail Access Program, the Regional Agriculture and Food Sovereignty Working Group, the Madison Metropolitan School District Advanced Learning Advisory Committee, and the Board of Directors for Beth Israel Center. Please join me in welcoming our candidates. Thank you, Reverend Asbruth Jackson. Well, good evening, everybody. When I'm on TV, I don't get that feedback, so it's, it's nice, to, nice to get that once in a while. Uh, thank you all for uh, coming out on this steamy, stormy evening, um, which we've had a lot of lately, as you know. Uh, to, we're going to be exploring climate issues, obstacles, and solutions with the four uh, candidates that you see here. They were just mentioned, so I will not uh, give the names uh, uh, again, but so I'm Bob Lidmeyer, senior chief meteorologist at WKOW TV. You might wonder, well, what's the difference between a chief meteorologist and a senior chief? Basically, the chief does all the work. As a senior, I get to just coast along a little bit. Um, <laughs> so Cam is our chief meteorologist at uh, WKOW TV. I'm the, uh, I'm the senior chief meteorologist. I, I fill in. I'm, I'm basically semi-retired and a role that I enjoy doing. Still like dabbling in, in weather. 
But my, my other passion is climate change education. I like to use my position as a trusted messenger to get out and speak to all kinds of groups. And I've been doing that now for, for a number of years. Um, I'm also a member of the Wisconsin Creation Care Ambassadors and the Citizens Climate Lobby, two of the seven uh, sponsoring organizations for this evening's event. They were mentioned, but I think we'll just go through them again because they are so critical. They are 350 Wisconsin Action, uh, Faith Connect for Climate Action, the Four Lakes Chapter of the Sierra Club, Renew Wisconsin, and our hosts, the First Unitarian Society's Climate Action Team. There are a number of people to thank for producing this evening's event, starting with the organizing committee uh, chair, Nancy Vetter Schultz, and cons that uh, committee consists of Wendy Weber, Liz Hatchen, and Mark Schultz. We must also thank First Unitarian uh, Society staff members, Drew Collins and Dan Carnes, for providing technical support and volunteer videographer, uh, Jim Vaines. So thank you um, from all those people. Uh, before we get started, I should explain how the forum will be structured. We will start with a brief two-minute opening statement from each of the four candidates. They have been asked to introduce themselves and reflect on why the climate is important to them. I will then pose a series of climate, five climate-focused questions that were suggested by this evening's sponsoring uh, organizations. Each candidate will have the opportunity to respond and again, they have been asked to keep their remarks under two minutes. We have a timekeeper in the front row, who's right very front, and who will give the speakers a 30 second time remaining, the yellow card, and then the red card, which means that uh, they must stop. And uh, then after that, I will call the next speaker to, give, uh, to take their turn. After those initial five questions have been asked and answered, we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Unfortunately, we are not equipped to uh, field questions uh, from folks on the live stream. The Q&A will go until 8.45, uh, when we will conclude the forum by inviting each of the candidates to make a brief closing statement. So, that sets the, the, the ground rules. So let's get underway and hear from the candidates themselves. We will go in reverse alphabetical order for a change, and start with Regina, and then we'll uh, follow down with Wes, Dana, and Melissa. So Regina. Okay, can you hear me first of all? Excellent. Uh, bring it closer, okay. How's that, is that better? Yeah. Excellent, all right. I'm Regina Vitiver, the scientist, public health professional, and experienced leader running to be your next Dane County Executive. But the most important job I have is as a mom. My children are young adults now, and they've told me that they don't think that they're going to have kids because they don't believe the world will be habitable for their children in the future. So let that sink in. My children are planning not to have kids of their own because of how severe our climate crisis is. That should be sobering for all of us. It's critically important our leaders recognize we are in a climate crisis and are willing to set progressive goals and provide the resources to achieve them. Here in Madison and Dane County, we are doing the work. Dane County has already reached 100% renewable energy for our operations, and we are working towards net zero emissions countywide by 2050. At the national level, the Biden-Harris administration has put the U.S.'s climate goals back on track. Through their leadership, the U.S. is making an unprecedented investment in climate action and environmental justice. This national investment translates to local opportunities, as a member of the Madison Common Council, I have been proud to help sponsor Madison's all-electric bus rapid transit system, expanding safe bike and pedestrian paths, providing energy and cost savings retrofits for multifamily affordable housing, and implementing Wisconsin's first building energy efficiency policy to reduce emissions from large commercial buildings. All of these projects cut carbon pollution, improve our air quality, and protect the health of our community. We need elected leaders to set ambitious climate goals and provide the support to get the job done. I'm proud to be endorsed by the 314 Action Fund, the PAC for Scientists, and will carry my scientific training into the role of county executive. I'm a passionate supporter of Dane County's planned sustainability campus, will continue to shepherd critical land conservation, and lead us into renewable energy usage that benefits all of us. For my children and for yours, we don't have time to waste. 
I took that as the timer. <laughs> that could be the tone for the next person. <laughs> Bob, I guess that's live TV, huh? That's, uh, <laughs> and the secret of live TV, you go on like nothing ever happened. <laughs> that's right. Uh, so, Regina, I'm sorry, you were, did you finish? Yes. If, do, do you want to restate a little bit? Because we were distracted a little bit. I'm are, you, okay. are you good? Excellent. I'm okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, we'll go on to Wes. Thank you. Um, yep, yeah, my name is Wes Sparkman, and I'm, I was a student here at the University of Wisconsin here. Uh, my undergraduate major was sociology. And in my interest with sociology, it's a study, study of groups and people and how they, how they interact. And so I'm concerned about the climate's impact on people. Um, I went back to school later after starting work at uh, uh, Dane County. And, and I earned my graduate degree at the La Follette School of Public Affairs. I later served as president of the Rotary Club in Madison. When uh, Going Green was initiated as a fellowship group, I decided, yep, as president, that's something that I wanted to support and do. You may know uh, Carrie, or Karen and Larry Hands, and uh, they're, they're excellent supporters of climate and climate action. And what I decided to do was kind of get out of the way of their leadership in a lot of ways and let the experts uh, continue. They uh, went on to create national awareness or international awareness of, of climate action uh, with the Rotary International uh, Program. And now they have 200, 2,000 members of their, uh, their Green Fellowship with a focus on climate action. As a department head, I recently participated in our internal emissions inventory update meeting. Um, and it's a look into countywide emissions. I have a recognized ability to listen and make sound decisions. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about solutions that I have, which is the fact that Dane County needs to make sure it takes full advantage of federal funding to assist climate action in local government that's coming down the road, support and develop incentives for people to switch to renewable energy sources, and so much more. Thank you. Thank you, Wes. Uh, we'll go to Dana. Hello, uh, my name is Dana Pelabon. Thank you so much for having us here. Um, so my, my first real interaction with how climate change can change your entire life trajectory was Hurricane Katrina. Uh, my entire extended family lost everything with Hurricane Katrina. And what we found was that the response um, was a part of the environmental racism that had been happening that honestly I didn't understand had been happening. Um, I learned a lot from that space because um, we didn't have any choice, right? Um, we didn't have anything left. Um, so when I became a part of the county board, uh, one of the things that was really important to me, and one of the things that continues to be very important to me, is the environmental racism that, that still happens here in our community. You know, Dane County is a leader in environmental 
um, and climate change policies. Um, County Executive Parisi, County Executive Falk, um, even in our legislature, we have um, here in this area done so many things. Um, but the people that are being left out are the people that are most vulnerable and the people that are most impacted. Um, so I, I spoke out quite strenuously about the F-35s and also the PFAS over at the airport, because those are, those are spaces where our most vulnerable folks are impacted. And one of the things, as I, as I went through our 200-page climate action plan, y'all, it's 200 pages, which is amazing, um, is that we talked about new buildings. But one of the things that we haven't talked a lot about are the buildings that are still, um, that have already been built. Um, it's one of the things that I'm gonna do with my capital improvement plan. Um, so we will have a capital improvement plan. We have not had one in 10 years. And part of that capital improvement plan is to look at the environmental factors that are in our buildings now and plan for them out in advance. Um, so that is essentially um, why I'm here to talk about oh, that. That's what I'm here. <laughs> Thank you, Dana. Uh, Melissa. Thank you everyone for being here and for the organizations that have brought us all together and to the Unitarian uh, Meeting Hall for sharing their space with us tonight. We're at a pivotal moment here in Dane County and we need bold, effective leadership in order to move ourselves forward. Dane County is not just where I live, it's where I was born and raised and where I'm raising my four amazing sons. I learned how to swim in these lakes and I learned how to ride my bikes on, on these streets and I wish that it was the same for my children. I understand the importance of good quality county government, not just because I was on the county board and in the state legislature and served as the Democratic leader in the state Senate, but because county government was there for me when I was growing up and there were needs in my life. I grew up learning how to shop for food with food stamps when they looked a bit like Monopoly money stapled together. I benefited from free lunches in school when I had to stand in a different line from the other kids and get different food. And I experienced housing insecurity when I was growing up as well. But I knew my dreams mattered. I knew my dreams mattered because of good government. However, I do know that there are areas that we can do better. I lost my youngest brother to fentanyl poisoning during the pandemic and that was gut-wrenching, and I know not unique for many of us in this room, but there are empty holes in many of our hearts. We need to address these issues. The county is innovative and bold in many ways, and we are very lucky to call this place on earth our home. But we know that we need to protect ourselves, our earth, and the vulnerable people that we share space with. My track record is proven, it is unique in developing real pragmatic solutions and bringing people together. And I am unapologetic about the work that I do. I am excited to be running to be your next county executive and I am thrilled to be here today sharing space so that we can have these conversations about our planet Earth and our impacts on it. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Okay, it's time to move on to our uh, forum questions. And from our four sponsors, our questions. Uh, we're gonna, I think uh, we're gonna start at the far end and work our way this way. So Melissa, the, you'll get the first uh, question to start with, and then we'll work our way down the table. So question one. Former county executive Joe Parisi implemented a number of key policy changes on sustainability, clean energy, and use of renewable energy sources during his time in office. How do you plan to build on this legacy? How would climate action fit into your broader set of priorities as county executive? So I'm thrilled to have uh, the endorsement and support of both County Executive Parisi and Falk who are innovative national leaders when it comes to seeing what good government can do to protect our environment and ensure that we have an un environmental justice for everyone that calls home. I am a proven environmental champion who has been recognized by the Wisconsin Conservation Voters and um, endorsed by Clean Wisconsin Action Fund. I will be continuing to lift up the important work that both County Executive Parisi and Falk have done. I know that many of the things that they have prioritized, not only by creating the Office of Energy and Climate Change, but also providing resources for local governments across Dane County or municipal governments 
um, being examples for our business community and our nonprofits, and removing barriers for the people that live right here in Dane County. Um, climate justice uh, and our environment are number one issues that drip from the lips of the people who live, work, and play here in Dane County. It is clear that people in our communities care deeply about um, our environment, our lakes and watershed define Dane County. Our natural spaces are what makes us so very special. We are one of the biggest food producers in the state of Wisconsin right here on top of being government and um, the university. And it is clear that no one can do this alone. Um, we need to lean on the people with the expertise and the experience. Um, we need to be good stewards and provide a strong vision, knowing that we can not only be a national leader, but an international leader on how to bring people to the table and ensure that we are leaving this planet in better shape than what we inherited from previous generations. Thank you. Dana. So, um, as we know, that the county already has some amazing plans. So here's what's going to be next. Um, we need to make sure that food waste is being taken care of. Um, and I think about programs like Urban Triage um, that has an agricultural program that makes sure that any food that's produced is brought to the community. It is different than putting them in spaces that the community has to come to. Instead, they bring the food to the community to ensure that there isn't food waste. Um, again, um, we do need to, sorry, uh, we do need to be more concerned about what is happening over on our north and our east side with the, uh, the noise um, impact on, from our F-35s. Um, we have not pushed hard enough. There is no, no remediation that is happening, um, and the impacts are going to be for, for generations. Um, so we need to push harder. Um, our, our county executive's office stayed out of that, that, that fray. We're not going to, um, because environmental racism um, is the last landscape here and our climate action change policies that need to move forward. Um, and again, um, making sure that we are assessing um, our, our facilities to make sure that they are um, energy efficient as possible and then planning for that. Because even if I know that we have um, some things that need to get done, we need to be able to budget for it. Um, so I'm going to um, institute um, as I spoke about in the, in the opening remarks, a plan for us to budget these things moving forward um, and keep our taxes at the same level because we will be paying attention um, to what is happening with our debt that is dropping off um, instead of taking on new debt. Thank you. Okay, Wes. Yeah, County Executive Farisi set it, Dane County on a great track, on an excellent track. A lot of people don't know that the uh, Yale Climate Opinion Map says that 81% of Dane County residents are engaged and involved in climate action. We're on the right track. I'm, I currently serve as a department head for Dane County, appointed by County Executive Parisi, also appointed by County Exec Executive Parisi to serve and help develop the climate action plan that we currently have. And, I, and I'll quote a little bit about the rural urban relationship that we need to work on going further. In the plan, it, it points out that Dane County had the highest total corn, total corn for grain production of all 72 counties in the state in 2017. It also had the highest soybean production in the state. It had the third highest wheat production. It had the third highest milk produ production. And it had the fourth highest number of cattle. A lot of people don't realize that. In addition to one of the most robust farm economies in Wisconsin, rural Dane County has 27 county parks, five watersheds, 69 named lakes and ponds, and 475 miles of streams, and more than 52,000 acres of wetland. So we got, we've got a lot to work with, and we have a lot to focus on. So as Dane County Executive, that's what I hope to do. Regina. So I like to say that, um, you know, Parisi's greatest legacy is what he's done for our climate and that I want to keep everything going that he did. Just keep everything on track and also get Amtrak here, but um, that's, that's, another, that's another answer. Um, the one thing that I would say that is 
we need to really focus on going forward is where we build housing. We need to make sure that we are building housing in existing transportation corridors and urban cores so that we do not contribute to sprawl because that contributes to climate change. So as we think about density, we really want to think about that and connect it to transportation. Um, we have an amazing um, tree canopy um, mapping program that shows us where the tree canopy is and is needed. So we can use that to prioritize plantings in our municipalities and in our towns. Um, we have one of the best websites promoting what the Inflation Reduction Act does for climate for the county. I want to shout out to county staff who developed that. I have heard up and down and around that this is one of the best websites that anyone has put together. But we need to publicize it. People need to know that that website is available and has amazing resources on it. There is great stuff happening in our um, communities. So Middleton, for example, has uh, a carrot for building uh, energy efficient buildings where they give a height bonus. So that can be a model for other municipalities and the county can brought, can, staff can provide technical assistance to um, different municipalities for doing things like that. I am so excited about the Sustainability Campus, AKA the new landfill. It is going to be amazing. I mean, there's gonna be so much that is never put in the landfill as a result of the work that is being done to plan that. And as Supervisor Pelabon said, we have to have a capital improvement plan so that we can plan for that um, growth. Um, we are also doing a lot with floodplain assessments, and so there will be engineering solutions that come forward, and we will need to decide how best to invest in those. All right, so we'll go on to question two. Uh, this time we're going to start with Dana and work our way this way. All right, so here's question two. The county's climate action plan calls for a 50% reduction in countywide carbon emissions by 2030. Progress towards this goal has been slow so far. The most recent data from 2017 to 2022 shows a drop of 3%. While county government has been doing very well with adopting clean energy, our residential and commercial sectors are lagging far behind. Beyond supporting the Inflation Reduction Act, what can the county do to provide additional impetus for our citizens and businesses to reduce their carbon emissions? So I, I want to also um, highlight that while we only had a 3% reduction, we had a 7% increase in population. So knowing that that population increased 7% for us to have a 3% reduction um, isn't as slow, in my opinion, as, as I'm, I'm sorry, I think you're amazing, but as, as Mr. Lindmeyer said. Um, <laughs> sorry, friend. Uh, so... When I think about what the cities um, and our towns need around Dane County, what they need is technical assistance. What they need is incentives. Um, the same with businesses. So making sure that people have access to grant programs, making sure that people understand what resources are available um, in the community and in our state and in our federal government that they can utilize. And I think about um, places like Project Home. I used to uh, manage places for Project Home way back in the day. And they have a program where they come into apartment buildings, they come into homes, and make them more energy efficient. So making sure that programs like that are highlighted and being made widely available. Um, so there could be incentives if there is money in the budget. And you're gonna hear me saying that a lot. A lot of times there are so many things that we want to do, but we really do need to be mindful of the money that is being spent and the priorities that they are being spent on. Um, we do not have a, a large flow of money that's coming through. We hope with our, our district change and our maps changing that we will get some movement from legislature on, on our, our surplus, um, but we can't wait for that. And so instead, we need to be mindful of where our priorities lie and how it is that we are funding them. So I have 700 plans, but I also need you to know I am going to be looking at um, what are the priorities that affect those who are most impacted in our community and um, looking at our budget and how to fund them. Uh, Wes. Yes, thank you. I, I uh, mentioned a little bit about uh, my academic background. 
Uh, but you know, this is an area where I would rely on the experts in going forward. I spoke uh, earlier today with the director of the climate office for Dane County and make sure that I had a, a current and real understanding of how things are going right now. And uh, uh, she was very positive that Dane County is gonna reach his goals, uh, just as was mentioned earlier. So uh, some of my solutions and my thoughts is that we need to take advantage of the federal funding that's coming this way uh, to assist in climate action for local government, specifically for local government. We need to support and develop incentives, incentives to, to people to switch to renewable energy sources. Recommend more trees and greenery in building projects. Support clean air legislation. And support annual Dane County, I would support an annual Dane County Climate Summit to discuss that. Regina. So one of the things that I'm extremely proud of um, from being on the Madison Common Council was sponsoring our building energy savings program. So it turns out that our large commercial buildings in Madison are uh, responsible for about 30% of the emissions. I was really shocked that it was that big of a number. So that program really does have the potential to reduce emissions. Now, it's really just getting started. And again, I'm a scientist, so I like to you know, do the experiment and see what happens. So I am hopeful about it, but I want to see that it works before we say, hey, this is something other municipalities should consider. Because, you know, it's, it's not trivial to do. So it is something that it does take investment. So um, it is something that I think is worth exploring in our other municipalities. When we think about transit, we have to work on reducing people's needs for single vehicle travel. And so Madison Metro isn't going to be able to serve the entire county. So what are other things we can do? We can provide park and ride sites and shared van services. In talking with the village of Wanaki, they're like, we have so many people that are traveling to the university each day. If we had two vans a day, you know, morning and afternoon, we probably could cut down considerably on the number of cars that were going there. You know, so creative solutions like that. Also thinking about how we encourage bike and pedestrian walkability, bikeability, rollability. Um, our county highways are not at all bike friendly. Um, that is a path that we could move, to move towards. Um, obviously, that also will take investment, so we have to do that carefully. Um, and then things around our agriculture. Um, we can do more to help our farmers talk about um, planting crops that um, sequester carbon and uh, also help hold the soil. Um, these are just a few of the things I'm sure we're going to get to more as the evening goes on. Melissa. So there are things that each and every single one of us can do to make positive impacts on our environment and decrease our carbon footprint. Um, and it is vitally important that our government is a leader in making that happen. Um, there are many steps that we can take, many steps that have already started to be taken. Um, providing incentives for new building. Um, we have this plan that says that we need to build roughly 7,000 new houses every year for the next five years. Imagine the difference that we can make if we use innovative building practices that are healthy for our environment as we're doing that. In addition, taking advantage of the IRA at the federal level in our partnerships with our local workers, our legal, local trades unions, to make sure that we are using the best practices and hiring local people so that we're not transporting people all over to come here and do the work. But we are using the workers that are already homegrown here. Um, innovation, innovative building practices. We have a project on East Washington Avenue that is using um, wood product in the building. Um, it's going to be the first one. Uh, in the city of Madison. Is that something that is going to work cost effectively? Can we scale that up? Um, transportation in our community is a huge issue. What are we going to do to get people off of the roads? We need to be advocating in the Capitol building for RTAs. Governor Walker took that off of the plate even before he was um, sworn in after the election. And I've been on the front lines fighting for the re- um, authorization of RTAs in the state of Wisconsin. We need to, in addition, have um, alternative multimodal transportation options, including bike paths and walking paths, 
um, and uh, ensuring that people can get to where it is that they need to be um, without using their cars. We can also decarbonize our fleet, our county fleet, the vehicles that we use um, to keep us all safe. Uh, the list goes on and on, um, and as many people have said already, there are wonderful experts and great policies out there on top of the innovation that we can provide here in Dane County. Okay, uh, for question three, uh, we're gonna start with Wes. Low-income households and people of color often live in substandard housing that is not properly weatherized and that costs more to heat and cool than a better insulated home. Such housing contributes to global warming and forces many residents to pay 10% or more of their income on energy bills. This substandard housing is often surrounded by asphalt and or concrete with few places for children to play. These are not good and healthy places to grow up as well as being heat islands. As leader of the county, how would you address these issues? Thank you, Bob. Yeah, something that I've studied since being the director of the Office for Equity and Inclusion are uh, some of the restricted deeds uh, that exist in Dane County. I think something that we really have to do is be honest about how we got to this place where uh, there is uh, low-income housing because, and, and how that was originally formed because really the, it's all related. Um, of course, uh, schools are decided uh, based on, uh, on property. Uh, parks, recreational facilities are decided on where people live. And, and some of the, uh, the areas of, uh, of, uh, of difference exist because of the very framework that was originally established. So we have some work to do to, to deal with that. And part of that is making sure that there's knowledge. For, uh, the knowledge is, is there for people to become aware of um, uh, basic information about like what produces greenhouse gases. So burning, burning coal, oil, petroleum products, gas. What types of things produce that? And that's, that's knowledge that we need to make sure that people know about. And, and also, when uh, thinking about insulation of housing and so forth, it's important to, uh, to make sure that uh, people are aware of the challenges that, they, that they're facing and perhaps that they, their, their home is not property, properly insulated. So uh, those are some, some things that I think are going to be part of continued education that goes down the road, uh, making sure that, that that process of education is adequately funded, and, and of course, suggesting all of the other alternatives, uh, alternatives to uh, green, uh, people knowing what makes up greenhouse gases, again, methane, carbon dioxide, uh, nitrous oxide and the chlorofluorocarbons and water vapor that exist. So making sure people are aware. I think my time is up. <laughs> Regina. I want, I want to make sure that the timers are ready. <laughs> you can't cross the Because you, <laughs> you know if you're not, we will go on and on and on. So. <laughs> All right, um, so I really want to um, highlight the work of our efficiency navigation program. So this is a program that um, looks to uh, those uh, multi small multifamily uh, housing developments that are catering to low-income renters and that need efficiency upgrades. Um, and there's city money, there's county money, there's state money, there's fe federal money to be had to be putting into those programs. And they are um, both beneficial for the landlord, um, but they're particularly beneficial for the renter um, for reducing their costs um, and also incre increasing their health um, because it improves airflow. Um, I had someone contact me once and who was very upset because he was in a multi-unit building and um, someone was smoking in the building, not in his apartment obviously, but in a nearby one and it was coming in through his vents. And we are preempted by state law from doing anything about that, unfortunately. But if you have those retrofits, it will help, help the health of that person. Um, we have to, as I said before, we have to talk about the tree canopy and planting where we have opportunity to reduce those heat islands. Um, there are things that we are not doing um, around roof color. We know that if we literally just have white roofs, that it 
reduces the, you know, the amount of heat that is being absorbed into the space. We don't do that. I don't know why we don't do that, but it's something that I think that we can work towards um, to, to work, work for. Um, and then as we think about our housing affordability fund and our investment in that, and again, I'm very proud to have been uh, part of the group that voted to increase Madison's housing affordability fund. Uh, Dane County also has increased that. And as we think about that fund, um, thinking about the energy efficiency of those buildings. Um, I've also done a lot to try to connect developers to many of the groups in the room to talk about all electric buildings um, and to talk about um, geothermal um, and what the potential return on investment is for those. So just having the developers be aware of those opportunities is also really helpful. Very good. I have a backup timer here just in case. Uh, Melissa. So housing is at a crisis point here in Dane County and I'm a firm believer that housing is a fundamental human right. Um, we need to make sure that we have safe and equitable housing for everyone. We can't just be throwing up um, unsafe housing um, for people in our communities. We hear too often about challenges of people, especially in low-income housing, and people who are on the edge. Um, in my office as a state senator, I have people reach out to me on a pretty regular basis with concerns about the housing that they have and feeling like they can't complain to the landlord or the tenant resource center or to an attorney about Rem remedying the situation because there's nowhere for them to go if they lose the housing that they are in and they are just grateful for what they have. Um, so we have work to do at the state level to right the wrongs, um, investing more in tenants' rights um, and making sure that we are leveling that playing field for the last decade. It has gone in the right direction and landlords have an awful lot of power. And people who are struggling end up accepting what they should not accept. Um, we have wonderful examples of housing in Dane County that we should be reproducing. The redevelopment of the Bayview housing on the Isthmus in Madison is fabulous, culturally appropriate, environmentally friendly housing that people are raising their hands and saying, yes, I want that in my backyard. We need to do more of that. We need to work with developers and with the utilities um, and with nonprofits to ensure that we have lifelines for people in our communities as well um, and provide incentives for landlords so that they, if they are honestly wanting to do better, that they can do better and they have a way to move forward through that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dana. So if you're paying attention to the developments that are coming forward that are affordable housing, a lot of them have these elements embedded in them. They're making sure that there is green space. They're making sure that there is space for gardens um, and that they are energy efficient. So the new spaces um, are, are innovative and they are coming to our community with great innovations. Now that is for just the energy. We're not gonna talk about services because what we're here to talk about right now is energy. So let's talk about the, the buildings that are currently existing. Um, so we know we have a lot of older housing stock in our community. Um, so again, um, programs like what Project Home does, which comes into the building and uh, cost effectively um, it installs new windows, installs install insulation. Um, in addition, um, you can talk to the property owners about what it is that they need to do and the, the tenants. Um, so my, my son's father owns buildings. What we did is we went through his buildings and, and talked about what could be more energy efficient. So we changed lights. We made sure that um, there weren't lights that were on all the time. So we had the, the magic light switches that go away when there's nobody in the hallway. Um, so we, we can actually talk to people and say, here are these incremental changes that you can do in this building to make it easier and make it better um, energy efficient wise. Now, as far as the actual um, slumlords that are here in our community, there's really not much that we can do about that because there's laws that prevent us from doing so. So instead, um, we need to make sure that the housing that is being built 
is being built with um, these things in mind and that they are actually affordable instead of um, on paper affordable, which is what a lot of our housing is um, at this moment. And again, um, that constant conversation because there are incremental changes that can be made and all you have to do is have a conversation about it. Okay, we'll go on to question four and uh, Regina is going to be first up. One of the biggest challenges facing Dane County is how to manage growth, particularly given that the county's population is projected to increase by 200,000 people by 2050. The Capital Area Re Regional Planning Commission recently issued a framework for sustainable growth with strategies for reducing carbon emissions and conserving natural and agricultural resources while also ensuring access to jobs housing and services for all residents. But the success of this regional plan is far from assured. What do you see as the biggest challenges to sustainable growth in Dane County? And as county executive, what will you do to ensure that local plans and policies align with the larger regional goals? That was a lot in that question. There was. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, as you said, we have fantastic plans. We have incredibly knowledgeable, committed people who have been putting these plans together. And we need to implement them. So how do we do that? So it is going to be through looking at um, what each community can accommodate and is willing to accommodate. Um, I'm thinking about the village of Oregon that is doing a transportation study right now. Um, they got a state grant to do this, so it's not they put in some of their own money to it, but most of the money is coming from the state. And so they're really asking their residents, what would you use? Because it does no good to come up with a solution if people aren't going to use it. And again, as a scientist, I like to do the hypothesis uh, and do the experiment. And I'm so interested to see what they get because, again, that could serve as a model for many of our, our other communities for figuring out how we build more sustainable transportation to get people where they need to go, which is one piece of that question. Um, the housing obviously is enormous. As Senator Agard said, we have a regional housing strategy. We have 17 um, approaches in that strategy. We need to implement every single one of them. And they have to be done with transportation in mind, with access to services in mind, with walkability, bikeability, with um, also obviously the environment in mind. And so we don't want sprawl. Um, even though we do need some modest growth in our towns, but the majority of growth needs to happen along our transportation corridors. Um, and all of this has to be done with appropriate engineering solutions, um, because as we know, when we incre increase um, surface area that is not, I'm blanking on the word, somebody will get it for me. Thank you, Permeal, permeable surface area, um, we have issues with stormwater, so that, and that's actually CARPC's um, purview, so we need to be mindful of that as well. Okay, we'll go to Melissa. So it is exciting to think about all the poten po po sorry, potential growth here in Dane County, and it comes with real challenges. Um, certainly there are parts of it that can be very concerning, and we need to be thoughtful. Um, I am honored to be endorsed by mayors and local elected officials from across Dane County. I have been on the front lines in the Capitol building watching local control be decimated in the state of Wisconsin. In order to make sure that we address growth in Dane County and do it in a smart way, we need to have collaborative partnerships with local electeds from the municipalities that call Dane County home. The Dane County executive can hold um, the role of being a convener. We can be um, a good role model. Uh, we can use our county resources uh, to bring people together and to address these problems. A number of ways that we can do that are, again, the regional transit authority that we can't have right now. We need to get in Wisconsin. Dane County is not the only place. There are red communities and blue communities that are advocating for RTAs to be back on the table. We need to be thoughtful about where we're putting housing in relationship with that transportation. Um, we need to make sure that we are supporting smart zoning in communities across Dane County. Um, and 
providing resources to our mayors and local elected officials um, so that they do zoning in the appropriate way. The zoning department with the county needs to support that process um, and be on the front lines and know that their job is customer service to those communities. And we need to do all of this with an eye on our environmental impacts, whether it's our water, um, our parklands, our farmlands. Um, these are things that we treasure here in Dane County. Um, and there are certainly ways that we can thread these needles, but it is gonna mean real collaboration from people with all, within all the municipalities in Dane County in order to make this go forward. Dana. So when I met with the Dane County uh, Small Town Association, the things that they were most concerned about was the county putting forth plans without them uh, because that was the feeling that they had. Um, so that is the first thing that I would stop Instead, in bringing people in to talk about the plans that we are doing that actually affect their communities. So when we're then meeting with them about zoning laws, we are on the same page on those zoning laws. And instead of working um, separately from them, we are working collaboratively with them. Um, in addition, uh, making sure that um, that all of our spaces, when we are doing that planning, um, are being looked at holistically. What services are available to the folks in the community? Can that community support those services? Um, how much of that services have got to come from our nonprofit um, sector and how much has got to come from our county agencies? Because we do need to plan for those things. Um, in addition, making sure that there is transportation, and I love the idea of a regional transit authority, and I absolutely believe it should be back on the table, but I don't know how we're gonna pay for that, friends. And I don't know that, um, that that regional transit authority is gonna be the solution to all our problems because as Alder Vividor said, um, we don't know, we don't have enough information about what is going to be used in our rural spaces. So that has to be studied a little bit more um, distinctly and, and thoroughly before we can say these are the things that we are going to do um, because we don't have all of the information to move that forward. But what it is I can commit to you is that we won't move things forward without everybody at the table and collaborating and looking at our financial resources to move that forward. Wes? Yep, as, uh, as county executive, I would, to answer the question, I would implement the roadmap. And I'm familiar with, uh, with uh, departments putting plans together that they expect to be put into action. So uh, I would, of course, engage the experts, uh, initiate subsidized housing projects one at a time. I had the opportunity to serve uh, on the Economic Stability Council uh, previously where 1,000 units were, were developed and created. Um, this was a, a council that uh, was comprised of bankers. It was comprised of, uh, led by the United Way, uh, government uh, expertise also involved. And that's the type of collaboration I think is necessary. I agree that collaboration is critical. Uh, I work to establish that type of uh, rapport as a police and fire commissioner when I served for 10 years, uh, and also as a community development block grant commissioner where I served, again, appointed by County Executive Parisi. So also to, to answer your questions, I think the, bi the biggest challenges are affordability, accountability, making sure we do what we say, and sustainability. So keeping those projects moving once they get going. And we have projects started in the city, towns, and villages that surround uh, the city of Madison, and that's something we need to stick to. Okay. Uh, the last question, before we uh, go to audience questions, we are gonna start with uh, Melissa. Transportation is a major contributing factor to climate change emissions in Dane County, and is also an equity issue to make sure all people, especially those most in need, have good access to jobs, medical facilities, shopping, and even green spaces such as our county's fine park system. Many areas of the county lack public transit options, while at the same time, there are proposed road expansions, uh, projects for the Beltline, for interstates, and for Stoughton Road, to name a few. 
What role as county exec would you like to play and what would you advocate for dealing with our transportation emissions and equity issues? So transportation has come up already in a number of the questions that we have been proposed to, but I'll work hard to bring those threads together in the answer here. Um, I am a firm believer in the RTA. Um, back in the late 19... 1990s, wow, it sounds like a million years ago when you say it that way, um, the county actually had a 2020 plan, uh, and then Scott Walker was elected. We worked together in collaborative ways, and just think about where we would be right now if we were able to institute that plan um, that was so thoughtfully put together from people all across our community. Um, in addition, I believe very strongly that we need complete streets um, as an option. We need to be thinking about how people are going to get from here to there um, that aren't on buses, that aren't on trains, that aren't on cars. Many people want to walk and there aren't um, safe sidewalks for them to walk. Many people want to ride their bikes. A lot of people have e-bikes these days and they tool around all ports of Dane County um, on, on those bikes, but we don't have adequate um, trails that are safe for people. Uh, we do need to do this with the lens of fiscal responsibility. Um, the state is sitting on a $3 billion surplus. I worked very hard as the Senate uh, minority leader, the Democratic leader of the state Senate, uh, to right the wrongs of our broken shared revenue um, in the state of Wisconsin. And while we moved the ball forward substantially, the city of Madison and Dane County did not get their fair share. We need to go and take another kick at the can when it comes to writing that shared revenue because our cities, towns, and villages need those financial resources to take care of their roads and we need to take care of the county's roads. Right now, we can't share resources and able to, in, it, in order to do that, even if we're on different sides of the highways because of state laws. So with my relationships in the state capitol building and my experience, um, as a county board supervisor and a lifetime resident of Dane County, I do know that these are things we can get done. Um, is it gonna be easy? Is it gonna be quick? No, but it is well worth it. Dana. Yes, and, because we don't have time to wait for the legislature. Um, number one, uh, there are things that are happening now so we have done expansion um, for some of our bike trails. We just finished an expansion over by Stoughton Road. Um, that's one of the trails that, that my husband introduced me to on our, our new e-bikes. Um, well, he doesn't have an e-bike, I have an e-bike. Um, and we have programs where we are putting bikes in the hands of children. Our Bikes for Kids program um, puts bikes for free in the hands of children so that they have an alternative mode of transportation. Because here's the reality, um, the, the, the bus system is not changing right now. We have to deal with the realities that are facing in front of us. And right now, that means that we've got to rely on the programs that are available. So um, we still do have uh, more plans for expansion of bike trails and paths. Um, we will continue with that. Um, we do need to um, invest in programs that um, keep those uh, transportation options open, including things like carpooling, um, shared resources, um, because at this point, there are not a lot of things that we can do with the laws. Not to say that we can't work on them, that is absolutely one of the things that should be done, and I commend um, folks like Senator Agar that have worked for years to get that stuff done, but we still have so much more movement to go. Um, and until we get to that point, we need to make sure that we are investing in the programs um, that, that fix the problems and that, that are in front of us right at this moment. Wes? Yes, I, I had the opportunity to volunteer for Bikes for Kids and help out with sizing helmets and uh, getting kids ready uh, to ride bikes. I think that's part of the solution, really involving young people and getting them involved in, in some of the answers. Um, and really, all, all children. Um, when I think about uh, transportation solutions and challenges and thinking about this event, I did prepare a list of uh, possible solutions that I'm gonna share a few. But uh, car sharing, I think is important. Carpooling, bicycling, as was mentioned, rail transit, public transit, alternative fuel vehicle use, 
electric vehicle use, scooters, hybrid vehicles. Of course, walking can save us all a little bit of uh, time. And cycling, use of electric bikes. So, so um, the, I, I do believe that electric options are important. Um, it's also important to have on-demand responses like, uh, like Uber and Lyft. Uh, those are efficient services. And of course, electric vans for car, carpooling and so forth. And Regina. So at this point, most of the stuff has already been said. <laughs> so we need a regional transit authority. Uh, we would do a half percent sales tax in order to fund it. Um, we need park and rides with shared van services, things like that. Um, cooperative car sharing. I know like our co-op housing spaces, um, that building on East Wash that is extraordinarily environmentally friendly also has, uh, as part of their plans, it was that they would have shared car services. Um, we need to have um, opportunities for our disabled folks um, beyond paratransit. On the Common Council, I was able to vote in a grant program to help fund our taxi service to be able to provide um, a disabled available uh, van so that um, folks who needed something in less than the 24 hours it takes to pre-ask for paratransit service would have an option. Um, we need to keep going with our, we are building it, but our inner city bus terminal is coming. Um, and then we have to have a way for people to get to that inner city bus terminal. Amtrak is coming, gosh darn it. Um, hopefully within about five years, we also have to have plan for ways for people to get to the Amtrak station, wherever that happens to be. Um, we've talked about, you know, B-cycle stations. Those are really important and they're really expensive. They cost multiple thousands of dollars to put in and usually it is a business that is sponsoring it because they are so expensive, but they are part of the solution. Um, and then we have talked about, you know, our county roads are not particularly conducive to bicycles and so that is an opportunity to uh, improve in the future. And I'll stop there because I think it's all been said. Very good. All right, uh, that's it for the, the questions from our sponsors. Now we're gonna move on to hear from uh, members of the audience. Please feel free to pose follow-up questions for some or all the candidates or ask about issues that have not been discussed. We do ask, however, that the questions stay focused on the general theme of climate and candidates. We ask that you continue to your, uh, keep your responses brief so that we can hear from as many people as possible. There's a microphone over here on the on your left. Uh, and uh, so uh, just please come to the microphone to ask your question so that everyone can hear, including the live stream uh, audience that and those who are watching uh, the recording. If you're not able to walk to the microphone, please raise your hand and we'll bring it with you. Are we on? Okay. Uh, there were uh, really a long list of excellent questions, uh, but this one didn't quite make the cut. And so I'm going to ask this question. It came from three, three of the sponsors. Um, as climate change worsens over the next 10 or 20 years, there will be significant impacts in Dane County. For example, we have already seen increased flooding in many areas, including Madison and heated debates about optimal lake levels and flood control measures. Uh, what policies will you pursue to promote local resilience and prepare the county and its residents for the worst impacts of climate change? Uh, okay, let's, uh, we'll start with you, Regina. Yeah. Okay, I was like, not sure where I was going. Yeah, okay. I, <laughs> um, so first of all, yes, the, that's all true. Um, and so I want to make sure that folks do know that the county takes very seriously the lake levels, and it's an incredibly nuanced approach to be able to change the dams and be able to move water. Um, we have had so much rain that there's only so much that can be done right now. Um, in terms of flooding, so Madison is undertaking a comprehensive floodplain analysis, um, and that is, I think, maybe two years from being completed, but it is underway. Um, some of them have been completed, and are, they are identifying where the major spots are for risk. 
And so therefore, those are the spots where engineering solutions will be proposed. Again, as we talk about a capital improvement plan for the county, um, that may be a space where the county can help municipalities when the municipalities do not have the capital op opportunity to do flood mitigation in their space, um, and the county can contribute to that. Um, so engineering solutions are really critical. Um, we have talked about um, um, crop cover um, and being able to do um, different kinds of crops with our farmlands so that the, we don't have soil erosion and, again, so that we can sequester more carbon. Um, there was something else on my mind that I've just lost. <laughs> um, but there, you know, again, looking at our plans and how we can um, make sure that we are concentrating on those areas that have the least and providing them with the most resources to be resilient is going to be really critical because we know that our low income and BIPOC communities feel these effects the worst. Okay, we're gonna mix it up and go from right to left. So uh, Wes, we'll go to you. Yeah, I think that's a very important question in consideration for the lakes and, and uh, quality lakes. Um, one thing that's gonna be important for the county to continue doing is relying on the experts needs of the planning department. Who, who knows, they know very well where uh, groundwater exists in Dane County. So paying attention to that. Um, also working with emergency, emergency management so that we can proactively kind of talk about and assess potential flooding uh, before it happens. So I think that would be one of my, my goals. Uh, as far as clean lakes and, and kind of water solutions, um, I would really place an emphasis on plant nature and diverse vegetation. Uh, of course, the use of rain gardens that was mentioned before, uh, redirecting downspouts. Uh, people don't realize the value of picking up pet waste and litter, so even that can help. Uh, reducing salt use in the wintertime, uh, encouraging people and families to start composting even more. Installing uh, uh, rain barrels where, where it's needed. And, uh, and, and again, emphasizing plant home food gardens as, as ways to uh, bring attention to uh, the valuable possibilities there. Very good. Uh, we'll go on to uh, Dina. So at the beginning of the year, um, our levels were actually lower than what they were supposed to be. Um, and then we got an enormous amount of rain. Um, so our dams are open. Um, and they are continuing to stay open. And we're even talking about, are there places that we can put other dams? Because right now, there isn't a solution. Now we are looking at things, there are studies that are going, um, and there are experts that are saying, okay, so we've done the things that we need to do, what is next? Um, so we are obtaining wetlands, we are doing um, the groundswell studies. All of those things are important, but until then, um, we, uh, we are also looking at dredging lakes, but one of the, the barriers is the ancestral lands um, of our indigenous folks. So there are spaces that we are are not dredging right now because we're still working through those negotiations. So making sure that those negotiations go well so that we can dredge our lakes and, and um, help make them more clean. Um, and again, making sure that we are relying on the people that have been working on this for decades. Um, this isn't something that we're going to magically come up with. There is still a lot of work that has to be done for the flooding in our towns, in our city, um, and what is happening with our lakes. And Melissa. So our lakes define our county. Uh, people come here and it puts a smile on their face uh, to be able to be here. Um, and I think those of us that live here uh, really appreciate and value them and we they are a they're a gem we need to take care of them uh, when i grew up i grew up learning how to swim in the lakes that was my summer vacation and if it was a lucky day there was a dime on the counter and i was able to get a popsicle after my swimming lessons and the art cart came and um, the bookmobile and stagecoach theaters um, we were outside breathing fresh air and moving our bodies and we are now at a point where our animals can't even go swimming in our lakes because of fear of blue green algae um, 
we need to be thinking comprehensively about how it is that we take care of our lakes, whether it is the lake levels where I was honored uh, to serve when I was on the county board on the Y Lake 2 study committee, seeing the complexities of these lake levels. Um, we had amazing scientists from the university, environmentalists, county staff, um, staff from uh, the municipalities that surround the lakes, everyone at the table. And different people have different ideas because they have competing interests about what level the lake should be at different times. Um, so we need to continue those conversations with one another. We need to lean on our experts at the university. We have world-class experts when it comes to lake levels and water quality. Why are we not partnering more with them in the work that we are doing? Um, we have innovative programs like Suck the Muck, um, cover crop programs um, that our farms can use, um, county land acquisitions to think about how it is that we protect our watersheds. We need to continue doing that, thinking about our infrastructure and our investment in our community. And we need to be mindful of historical artifacts that are in our lakes. We have seen canoes brought up um, that are older than any of us ever imagined that there would be wood there. Um, so making sure that we are thinking about how it is that the work that we're doing with the lakes impacts the people who were here before us. Very good. For this next question, uh, we're going to start with Wes, and Dana, you'll be after. Hey, thanks. Uh, this question is from a less optimistic scenario, but uh, what preparations can a county executive take? I guess if you could answer this both from a concern over environmental issues as well as uh, human services, what preparations or how can the county exec be better prepared in the not inconceivable scenario that this November we will see a change in hands of power at the White House? Thanks. Uh, whose question is that, Bob? Oh, that goes to you. Okay. No, great, great question. Um, I think uh, each, any, any person that's selected and as county executive, uh, I would continue to work closely with emergency management in, in preparation for uh, the challenges that will come up. Uh, as a past police and fire commissioner, uh, that's, uh, it was important to maintain uh, communications with police chiefs, fire chiefs, sheriff, uh, the, the sheriff and deputies. Um, and that came in really handy during COVID because what we needed to do was communicate with the communities uh, related to uh, public health issues that were taking place at that time. So uh, I think uh, building, continuing to build bridges and collaboration, I think is the most important thing in, in, uh, in preparing for emergencies. Okay, uh, to Dana. So Trump isn't the first bad president, especially for black people. So for, for, for me, um, I'm going to do the things that we've been doing our whole entire life, which is we organize. Um, we organize with the people. Um, we make sure that those of us that um, are most in need are taken care of um, and that those who are most impacted um, have resources available. And a lot of times um, we weren't able to rely on the government. You know, and, and I, I think back to, um, to Katrina and we had a president that did not care about black people, my friends, and did not have the mobilization. And instead, um, my great city of my, my family, they mobilized themselves. So my uncle got out on the boats and went to rescue people. My family fed people because that's what you do. Um, instead of waiting for things, we mobilize and we take care of our community, and that's what I intend to do, no matter who is elected president, because there will always be bad policies, and for black folks and brown folks and LGBTQ folks, there will always be something that we are fighting for and fighting against, and so I'm going to continue to do the work that I've been doing for my almost 50 years on this earth. Melissa. So. We have had experience 
when uh, he was our president before, and more recently during uh, the COVID pandemic, where having strong, bold, effective leadership has saved the day. Um, I am grateful for Governor Tony Evers, um, and I am grateful for the work that um, County Executive Parisi did during those terms. And we also have wonderful partners in our community uh, that we need to lean on and that we need to lift up. Um, Dane County is a pretty special place. We have a history of caring deeply about one another. Do we always get it done right the first time? No, we do have generational challenges that, that we experience. But when the rubber meets the road, when we need to have each other's backs, we'll have each other's backs. Um, I am super excited about electing Kamala Harris to be the next president of the United States of America. Um, and what I'm going to tell you is I'm not going to wait till November to find out. I am working every day um, to ensure that she is there um, because I know that she will do what we need her to do um, to ensure that Dane County and Wisconsin can continue to be safe places for folks. Regina. So I have been thinking a lot about this question because it's, it's really scary. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a crowd that knows current events and some of the things that have been said recently about how, well, you just need to vote this one time and you won't need to vote four years from now, which is, if anybody's not paying attention to that, they really need to. Um, so I think a lot about the time that I spent uh, in, in the State Division of Public Health during COVID. So my COVID assignment was um, doing all the procurement for all of the resources needed for the alternate care facility that we wound up opening at State Fair Park. And what I can tell you about that experience is that it showed me very deeply how important local resilience was. We had no coordination from the federal level. I mean, none. Every state was on their own. And we were lucky. We had Kimberly Clark. We had Exact Sciences. We had Epic. We had all of these resources in our backyards that we drew from and that was part of the solution. So having a locally resilient area where we have agricultural lands that are producing foods for us is really important. Having transportation that is reliable and can get us around to help our neighbors is really important. Having housing that's available for everyone that needs it is really important. So these are all things that are on my mind um, as I also work to make sure that we have the same administration in the White House going forward. <laughs> Okay, for this next question, we'll start with Dana, and then we'll go to uh, Melissa. Go ahead. All right. Uh, first, thank you all for wanting to uh, be a, one of our leaders. I really appreciate that uh, people have the guts to run for office, and, uh, and it's a very tough thing to do. So thank you all. And <laughs> and thank you all for expressing that you're going to be a. Uh, uh, continuing the, the strong leadership we've had on climate change here in Dane County. We can be proud of that here, and I thank you. But I've got another, I've got another question to ask you about the other, the other environmental issue that we have here. It's uh, PFAS. At the airport, many of you know, for decades they were training with the PFAS foam right next to Starkweather Creek, and uh, severely polluted Starkweather Creek. It's got one of the highest levels in the state. And of course, that pollution is also in Lake Monona and all the lakes down from there. The fish in those lakes are hundreds of thousands of times the standards of the PFAS that, should, that are, the EPA is proposing in uh, drinking water. And so eating one of those fishes is uh, like drinking that water for 20 years. It's, it's, a, it's just an amazing amount. So we have a real serious problem. Uh, Dane County has done some things, but as the owner of the airport and the land that is on it and the named responsible party, um, I would like to see a lot more being done to actually reduce the problem at its source and clean up the PFAS as much as we can there. We're now, of course, Well 15 is going to have $6 million, so we'll be drinking cleaner water. 
but I'm worried about the people who are eating the fish and the problem that could last for 200 years because that PFAS just keeps seeping out. So I'm wondering what specific things you as county executive are going to push for to get, make sure that that PFAS problem is, starts to be reduced instead of continuing. And what are you going to help, how are you going to help all those people who are standing on the side of the lake fishing every day for their families? Uh, we'll answer that question, but uh, keep in mind this is supposed to be climate specific. But uh, let's go ahead and, and uh, answer that question. Thanks for letting me be first for that one. <laughs> Um, so, when I was on the county board, um, we were fighting against the PFAS. Um, and what we found was that we didn't have very much movement that we could do because the contract is with the federal government. Um, so, what I would do is lean on our folks in the legislature, lean on our folks um, federally um, to, to make those changes. And again, you know, we. On the county board, we were really vocal about that. Um, we did not have that same support um, that I feel like we needed um, on the county exec level. So when I think about what the board and the exec could do together, pushing forward, that's where I'm gonna go with that. Because again, um, we spent months, sir, trying to find ways around that contract, trying to find ways that we could change the language of that contract. And um, folks like uh, County Board Supervisor Shvala, who, who really was um, the spearhead of that to say, this isn't okay. Um, but we didn't have very many choices. And I don't wanna overstate what it is that we can do because that's not being, being fair to what it is that we can promise. So instead, what I can say is, we have been fighting it, and we will continue to do it, and now we will have two unified voices to make that move forward. Melissa. So PFAS is pretty damn scary. Um, in the state legislature, I am the lead author of the most comprehensive bill in the nation, to address PFAS, and we need to move that bill forward. In addition to that being stymied by the Republicans in the legislature that represent communities across the state of Wisconsin that are literally drinking water out of bottles. Think about the hypocrisy. A plastic-borne chemical that is pervasive in our community, the Republicans' answer to solve it is by giving people bottled water in plastic containers. People are bathing their babies in PFAS contaminated water. The food that we are eating out of the ground is being watered by PFAS contaminated water. There are many people in Wisconsin that are dependent on the fish that is in our lakes, not just for recreation, but for sustenance. This is a fundamental issue in the state of Wisconsin. There is a bill that passed the legislature that the governor signed into law that is not being released money to address PFAS in the state of Wisconsin. We did get a bill passed to address firefighting foam. In a bipartisan manner, I was the lead Democrat. I worked with Senator Coles, the lead Republican, and we collaborated. Not easy, but we got it done. And we need to use that same tenacity to be able to address PFAS right here. I live on the, on the north side of Madison. The contaminated well is not far from my house. Um, this is something that is affecting our communities and we need the federal government to classify PFAS as a chemical that is dangerous to all of us and we need our state government to invest our resources so that our local communities can drink clean water, can eat healthy food, um, and can recreate in the water in our communities. Regina. This is a very sticky problem. PFAS is ubiquitous in our community, in our environment. Um, where we can mitigate it is in our drinking wells, um, and we are doing that. Um, I just learned recently from uh, somebody from the DNR that the town of Dunn actually has a significant problem with PFAS in their private wells. So those wells need to get tested and 
they need to have the, either mitigation or they will have to be drinking bottled water as well. Um, but that's not part of the Stark Weather watershed. That is not coming from the airport. It's not clear where the origin is. So we have to do more to actually track where it's coming from, but again, it is everywhere. So the other thing we have to do is harm reduction. Um, that is with the fish consumption warnings. Um, when I talk to folks who are out and about, they say, it's all very well and good to have that fish consumption warning on a website, but it's not signed where people are actually fishing. So we do need to do a bit better in terms of our actual on-the-spot, on-site communication, and it might mean sending out folks from our public health department to actually just have one-on-one -on -one conversations with folks who are doing subsistence fishing. Um, because it is important that they understand the harm that they could be in. Um, I'm also going to tell you a little bit about um, my husband's PhD research, which was uh, he identified bacteria at the Badger Ammunition plant that broke down nitroglycerin. And I am quite convinced that nature has a solution for us. We just haven't found it yet. So there will be a solution. We will have microorganisms that we will find are breaking down PFAS and we will be able to um, build them up in higher supply and, and put them into our environment. Obviously, it's always a really hard thing. Um, but we, we will have engineering solutions in the future. And so my commitment is, is that I will implement them as soon as they're available. Wes? I agree. I agree that there will be engineering uh, solutions. Uh, to answer your question, um, I think innovation is going to be uh, the key and looking for those solutions. Um, a lot of people, well, if you, if you look at the lakes and you look, look at who's fishing in the lakes, um, uh, like a lot of other climate issues, uh, some of the people that are most impl impacted right now, you'll see Hmong families fishing in the lakes. You'll see African-American families and Latino families fishing there. So uh, I will let you know that uh, one solution that had, did go through uh, recently uh, through the county in uh, linking up and trying to organize uh, departments such as the public health department was a grant to educate people on PFAS and, and its, da its dangers, uh, uh, the hazards of plastics and uh, ingesting plastics. So, so that's something that I would of course support. I would look for innovative ideas and I also make sure it's not just the public health department working on uh, solutions, but I think there's also a need for to educate through the human services department, veterans affairs department, people who fish, and of course the airport and other departments. So really collaborating and bringing all the departments together. Okay, uh, and uh, let's see here. I'm getting myself I'm losing track. Are we gonna start with Melissa, go ahead. Thank you, and thanks for being here. Uh, this event has given me an uh, occasion for hope and despair. I hope that we have four articulate, thoughtful candidates for county exec who accept the premise of the questions. Climate change is really happening, really serious, really important to address, and we can do something about it. And yet the despair starts floating around at perhaps the unavoidable squishiness and lack of specificity to the responses. And so I would like to ask each of you to tell us or, or ask what can you say or do that would convince us that you will keep the climate change crisis at the forefront of your decision making and at your uh, planning and strategizing to address the needs of our community in all the different intersectional ways that climate change being addressed helps solve the other problems. So I appreciate that question. I don't think I need a very uh, long answer. Climate justice is a frame with which I look through with all policy making, whether it was when I was on the county board or in the state assembly or in the state senate or the senate democratic leader. And I am here to say I guarantee you that it will be a lens that I continue to look through once elected to be the next county executive. Regina. 
Ditto. Um, <laughs> you know, so as a public health professional, you know, I look at things through a health lens and climate is such an enormous part of that, whether we talk about, um, you know, particulate matter or the effects of heat or um, water quality, all of those are completely interrelated. So I'll just say it's what I do, it's what I will continue to do. And as I said, I'm a mom. I want my kids to be able to keep living on this earth and I really do want them to have kids. I want grandkids someday, not yet, <laughs> but someday. Um, so I'm hoping they change their minds. I'm hoping that I'm part of the solution um, that helps them do that. So I, I don't know how to convince you that, it, that what I'm saying is real, um, besides the actions I've already taken. You know, we have people who don't believe in public transit. I do. Um, we have people who don't believe in density in existing transportation corridors. I do, and I've shown that with my actions on the, county, on the Common Council. So um, I, I, I hope you'll believe me. Wes? Yeah, I think uh, some people may be backing away from this question a little bit. I mean, some, some feel like we might need to terraform Mars or make life habitable on another planet on, on Mars. Um, I actually, and here in, here in church, I must confess that I'm a person of faith and that um, I do believe that it's part of our, our, our goal to take care of the earth and to be aware of what's going on in the earth. Uh, so. Um, so that's a concern of mine that that's not going to change and that's something that uh, I try to uh, talk to my four children about, uh, my wife and I, and, uh, and try to make sure we're, we're doing our part. Dana. So you cannot eradicate um, oppression unless you're eradicating all forms of oppression. You can't pick and choose. So everything that I do is about access, is about equity, it is about inclusion, and it is about anti-oppression work. Everything that I do, including things where I have great privilege in. And so I can't say to you, um, here are the words. What I can do is show you the 30 years where I have focused on anti-oppression work because you cannot get rid of one form of oppression until you are addressing all forms of oppression because they are all interrelated and they are all connected. Um, and my work and who I am and everything that I have done has been about that work. So that is how I will guarantee that we will work on it because it's what I do every single day of my life. This will probably be the last question. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but we'll start uh, with Regina this time and work our way down. Thank you. I appreciate everybody being here. I wanted to touch on something else that's only been mentioned a little bit peripherally, and it's our food systems, which have a great impact on the environment as well as people's health. We have a lot of great agricultural land here in Dane County but a lot of it is used to grow food that goes elsewhere, or crops, monoculture. We put a lot of agricultural herbicides and pesticides on the land, and you get a lot of runoff from that. And you have soil that does not hold carbon well. In the meantime, we have a lot of other areas too, including in our communities where people are growing large areas of grass, and again, putting chemicals down. And then, once we get done with a lot of the food, we also have a lot of food waste, which we're not dealing with very well at this point in time. So I'm wondering, what can we do to improve our food systems that will also improve our environment and reduce the climate impacts that we now have? Thank you. It's a great question, um, and a lot is loaded into that. So the first thing I want to talk about is, again, state preemption. We cannot ban pesticides. We cannot ban herbicides. Um, we can do that for the county. We can do that for each municipality. Um, but we cannot say, hey, in our county, no one is allowed to use it. We just, that's not allowed. Um, what we can do is work collaboratively. And we are doing that work, working collaboratively with our agricultural producers to talk about cover crops, to talk about, um, not spreading manure on frozen land. Um, 
that we might be able to have a policy solution for. We'll see. Um, but using manure pits instead. Um, we can talk about crop rotation. Um, we can encourage it. There might be opportunities for, say, grant making. Um, so put a little money behind it. Um, again, that will have to be budget dependent. Um, you asked about um, food waste. So we do have a USDA grant to actually examine our entire food system in the area. That work is underway, and I am 100% supportive of it. As a member of the Madison Food Policy Council, I have been in talks about um, food waste management, about having a food terminal um, where producers could come and bring their product, and then restaurateurs, uh, small businesses could come and essentially pick um, almost like a, a wholesale market. Um, that work got stymied by the pandemic, um, but that is definitely on people's minds and needed and part of that study. Um, and then there's the sustainability campus, which is going to have a very explicit food waste diversion program so that that waste is not ending up in the landfill and creating methane. Wes? Yeah, Dane County executive position, a lot of people don't realize it's a nonpartisan position. So the ability to uh, build bridges and work with farmers is something we should be able to do uh, without concern about partisan politics. Um, and I mentioned earlier that the county has the highest total corn uh, production of all 72 counties and also had the highest soybean production in the state. And so it really is a position of leadership that we have, and I think we need to accept our position of leadership and really uh, recommend solutions that we want to see carried out throughout the state. Dana. So when I was on the county board, um, one of the committees I was on was um, administered the PIE grant, which was for food access. Um, so investing in that program, investing in programs like the agricultural program at, at Urban Triage, investing in the programs that are happening over at Badger Rock Middle School, um, where you have urban farmers um, who are getting food out to the community, um, making sure that you are connecting with our nonprofit um, organizations and businesses um, who are working with our folks who are most impacted by, by lack of food access and bringing food to the communities. When we talk about a lack of transportation, um, we can't that in that same breath say, you need to go to the food pantry. We need to bring these, these um, pantries to these spaces, and we have. Um, so the organizations that I work with and the organizations that I am on the board for, we work to bring food to the community. Fresh food, organically grown by our people. We bring that food into our community. So investing in the grant opportunities that are currently available um, and um, investing in the programs that are doing the work to bring food to our communities that have um, food insecurity and food waste. Melissa. So when I was on the county board, I had the privilege of serving on the Food Council Committee, and we brought together the voices of farmers, um, as well as scientists and um, urban folk to figure out how it is that we can actually grow more food for people to eat in Dane County and remove barriers for that happening. There were conversations about creating a hub so that people who are growing food have a place that they can bring it. Now, um, that did not happen, clearly. There are some fiscal impacts on that. Um, but many of the things that we talked about on that committee are happening in our community, whether it's an increase in community gardens, um, whether it is supporting CSAs, um, whether it is encouraging and working with our farmers across Dane County to plant people food as opposed to animal food. Um, investing in cover crop programs. Um, we, a girl can dream, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to provide some innovation here. How can we collaborate with our school districts so that our schools are, and our institutions, whether it's um, within our jails um, or at Badger Prairie, um, that they are serving food that was locally grown and harvested right here in Dane County. 
what barriers can we remove there when it comes to washing, packaging, cutting, and transportation for that to happen? Um, programs that invest in lawns to legumes so that people in Dane County don't have grass in their front yards, but they have garden beds in their front yards. Um, and they are able to harvest tomatoes and, and green peas and, and peppers um, for them and their families and their neighbors to be able to have access to. Other communities have provided grant programs to be able to provide those right in their community. And I would love to see more front yards full of gardens as opposed to front yards full of grass. Um, clearly, the county can play a leadership role in this innovation. You know, Nancy, since you're the chair of the organization committee, I think we can work you in for a question. <laughs> and we'll start with Wes. I'm losing track. Wes, we'll start with you. So this is a question that is really important to me because I've been trying to figure out how to make this happen ever since I got involved in climate justice work. And the question is sort of goes back to what we were talking about earlier um, about low income communities. And it, I think it's sort of specifically about Project Home. Project Home is a wonderful project. It has wonderful goals and a lot of people don't do anything with it. It seems to me that the low income people don't want some assessor coming into their homes to see what they're like and don't trust the government enough to allow that to happen. And on the other side, the developers, not the developers, but the owners of all of these depart uh, apartment buildings don't want an assessor in their apartments because they're afraid they're gonna see something wrong there that has to be fixed. So how do we, I think the, the, the carrot is probably better than the um, boot on the head. How do we in, make it clear to low-income people that this really will help them? Uh, thank you for that question. And I think that, I think part of the concern is trust. I think that uh, people need to have, uh, need to know that it will be safe to have someone come into their home and provide education that is a suggestion, that is something that is going to benefit them. But I think that uh, uh, a lot of people, they don't, they don't care what you know until they know that you care. And so I think as county executive, I think that's important to, to make sure they know that uh, the county does care about what's best for them, looking forward, looking ahead, and as far as the economic development is concerned, uh, helping them realize the power and importance of uh, home ownership, uh, and also uh, developing uh, their home and ways to uh, insulate their homes and the best methods for that. So uh, I think, again, one of the main issues is trust and building trust so that people can, can really listen to uh, the uh, best practices. So I brought up Project Home um, because I've been in these households making sure that work gets done because I've built that trust. Um, the community um, works with the folks and responds to the people um, that are there with them in the community. And, and that's, that's what I have been doing. So as county executive, um, the, the folks of color who live here know that, know that at the end of the day, I'm their person because I'm the person that's standing with them every step of the way. Um, and as far as how it is that we get um, property owners on board, it's, it's what it is that I already did to get property owners on board. I talked to them about the financial um, benefits of it um, because at the end, you know, for, for someone that owns a property, um, they want to know how is it it's going to affect their bottom line. And especially for smaller property owners like my kid's dad, that's, that's how he pays his bills. So I've got to be able to show them um, what is the financial benefit, and I have, which again, which is why I brought up Project Home, because that is um, a place where I know that people can go. Um, same with mg and &E. There are programs over at mg and &E and the Alliance Center um, that I have connected property owners with. 
um, and that I have on a day-to-day -day basis connect our, our community with. But I would be remiss to not note that the only two people of color here are the two people that are sitting here, right? So it's not just my work. It is the work. There was one he left earlier. Oh yeah, bye Joe and Jalen, they go, they're gone. Um, but, you know, it is, it is the work of all of us because while I am here in the community doing this work, I want to be doing this work with people that care also. And so standing with me in those spaces and saying here are the things that we can do to help and without judgment, about what is happening in their home and without um, consequence uh, once people are in the space. So I really the answer is we need community validators. Uh, trust, it, I think it, does, it, come down, it comes down to trust and trauma. Um, people who are sick um, with uh, lifetime illnesses don't have the ability to navigate these systems or to even clean their houses. Um, if you're doubled up, if you're undocumented, um, if there are cultural barriers, uh, if you have behavioral health issues, um, if you suffer from addiction, um, if you're a domestic violence victim. These are all barriers, real barriers as to why you wouldn't want Project Home or anyone else coming into your house. So building authentic relationships with community validators. Um, Centro Hispano, the Monk Institute, um, the senior centers, they are out there. They are doing that work. Can we do better? Absolutely. But having the county executive knock on the door and say, this is something we want to do for you, isn't going to remove those barriers or increase trust. Uh, we need to lift up the people in the communities as our partners in order to um, to, to provide more access. Regina. There's not much more I can add. Um, it is truly about having those trusted relationships and it's, it is not gonna be the county executive. It's gonna be the, the entities that are in the communities doing the work. It's gonna be our community health workers. It's gonna be our nonprofit organizations. It also can be our faith communities and our uh, medical providers talking about it. So those are also, when we look particularly Right, in public health, we look at who are the trusted messengers, and it is typically people in the community, my doctor, the person that I have a relationship with, and my faith leader. And those are the key groups that we need to make sure are educated about the program and talking about it. Um, and I mean, I can honestly say that I don't know of any faith leader or physician who probably is talking about this on a regular basis. So it's an opportunity for education and outreach. Very good. We will end by inviting each candidate to make a brief closing statement, two minutes. Um, is I believe what we're confining to, yes. Uh, this time we're gonna start with Melissa and we'll work our way to the right. Thank you so much for all of the folks that helped make tonight possible, um, as well as each and every one of you who showed up, whether in person or online, and to my fellow candidates. It is hard work, as was pointed out, uh, to put your name on the ballot and to run for office. I am Melissa Agard, and I am thrilled to be a candidate for Dane County Executive. I know that right now in Dane County, we need a proven leader who is a collaborator and an unapologetic person about getting things done for everyone in our communities. It's clear to me from the countless conversations that I've had with folks that there is a desire for all of us to come together and solve generational problems, as well as continue to move Dane County forward in the best way that we already are. By protecting our democracy, investing in our workforce, and taking care of the most vulnerable folks who call Dane County home, as well as protecting and preserving the best parts of our heritage, we're gonna continue to lead the way. I am confident of that. I'm honored to have the support and the endorsements of folks at all levels of government, including Joe Parisi and Kathleen Falk, a broad coalition of current and former mayors representing every city in Dane County, statewide electeds, local legislators, local officials, and most importantly, my four boys, and hopefully many of you. These folks know that I am a leader with a proven track record who is committed to showing up 
listening, being engaged, and I'm not afraid to roll up my sleeves and get my hands dirty. I ask for your trust in your vote as I embark on my next chapter of leadership for our very special community as your county executive. Thank you for being here. So Dane County, you all are my chosen family. Um, I moved here in 1993 um, as an adult and said this is the place where I'm going to live and this is the place where I'm going to invest um, my time, um, my talents, and, and that's what I've done for 30 years. So it is one thing um, to be at a position of power. It is another to be in the trenches with folks working on these problems. So with most of the agencies, most especially our two largest agencies, these are agencies that I've been embedded in doing the work for 30 years, not as a, as a, um, as a participant, but as a person that is there to encourage, to empower, and to move things forward. Um, I create programs um, with the community that the community responds to. It's why a program that I created in the 90s to house single mothers still exists today because that program was created with folks in mind um, and with their input and with community partners. So, um, the last two years I have spent on the county board, um, I have developed even deeper relationships on the legislative level um, because I already have those relationships with businesses, with nonprofits, with the community. Um, so being able to um, coalesce my entire coalition of community because I am here with the power of community. I'm not here with the power of everything and anything else. Instead, I base my work in the work of the people and then project that forward because without the people and what it is that they are needing, what it is that they are wanting, we will never progress all together. So um, I want to be your county executive because this is the only work that I want to do. There's nothing else for me. Um, I have been here for 30 years doing it, and I'd like to continue moving that forward. Yeah, I'd like to start off by complimenting the Office for Climate that's doing an excellent job right now. In my career, I've been laser focused on Dane County and did my part to develop a Dane County action plan that works and positions us as statewide leaders. I'm a bridge builder that's willing to listen and activate solutions for climate. I'm best positioned to gain crucial nonpartisan support and work with farmers throughout Dane County. I'm most concerned about how climate impacts people. Check out my website at westsparkman.com and on August 13th, vote West. Thank you to everyone who has organized tonight, who has been here, who has questioned us. It has been an incredibly robust discussion. Um, I always walk away from these learning something new and um, tonight did not disappoint. Um, so I hope what you've heard tonight helped you understand a little bit more about who I am and what I bring to the table. And what I wanna leave you with is the knowledge that the position of Dane County Executive is an executive management position and I bring that experience in spades. With 25 departments to oversee, including multiple ones that impact climate, you need someone with management experience to be able to oversee people, programs, and budgets while ensuring that your tax dollars are spent on the priorities that make all of our lives better. I'm the only candidate with the executive man management experience who has worked at the federal and state levels at UW-Madison in nonprofit and who has elected experience at the municipal level. In short, I've been inside every type of organization the county interacts with. This means I understand what it takes for each of our partnering entities to be successful in working alongside the county to meet our shared needs. You also need someone who puts your health and you and your children's and their children's future first. With my background in science and public health, you can be confident I will spend all day, every day, working to make sure we have the resources and systems in place so that our county leads the way in climate goals that allow all of us to thrive. 
I will work collaboratively across our community organizations, board of supervisors, contractors, and the public to fund the things that truly work for the people who call Dane County home. I invite you to learn more and join my campaign at reginafordane.com and work together with me for a sustainable, equitable, and vibrant future for Dane County. Thank you. Our deep thanks to all four of you for coming out this evening to share your vision of Dane County. As a climate change communicator, I spent a significant amount of my presentation on solutions. And a significant part of my solutions is talking about what Dane County is doing. I'm so proud of our county. Joe Parisi has set a high bar for you four, but I, I'm really encouraged by all four candidates that are, that are here this evening. Let's have a round of applause for the candidates and for the people who organized the event. Please note that uh, the recording of this forum will be posted in the First Unitarian Society's YouTube channel by August 4th. And finally, don't forget about the primary election coming up very soon on August 13th, and please remind your family and friends as well. This is an important election, not just because of the primary for Dane County exec, but also because of the two proposed amendments to the state constitution that are also on the ballot. Your vote matters on August 13th, and August 5th. Thank you for attending. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.